Ladies and gentlemen, you are tuned into another episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. And now your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by a singer-songwriter who has affected the hearts of so many, a founding member of Frankie and the Knockouts. He's also a songwriter who has had cuts by everyone from Eric Carmen to Earth, Wind, and Fire. It's a great pleasure to welcome an Academy Award-winning composer and a creative force in music, Frankie Previtt. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Paul, for having me. My pleasure. So how goes it in this year, 2020? Well, like the rest of the world, it's been a crazy, crazy time for everyone. You know, it's uh, you would think that it's only affecting you in your environment, but it's really affecting the world. You know, we've become, you know, really involved in being one world. And um, no, no better time than now to experience this craziness. But, you know, sticking together, following the rules, we'll get through it. That's how we are as people. Amen. What has always been the purpose of the art you create? That's an interesting question. Uh, you know, the purpose, as you grow up, you know, the the seed that is planted earlier on gets kind of watered by you as an entertainer being the accolades that you get from when, when you sing and, and you're you're doing it from the love point of singing and writing. And as you, you know, grow and mature and, and your art form changes, so do you as a, as a writer, and um, your your writing matures. So all part and parcel of you realize that after you've got many years invested in it, that you become who you are. I became a, a songwriter, a singer, and then a recording artist, Frankie and the Knockouts, like you had mentioned, and bands before that, Bull Angus back in the 70s, on Mercury Records, who toured with Rod Stewart and Deep Purple and played, you know, Pocono Mountain Festivals and things like that. But those are the moments in, in an artist's life that keeps watering the seed, those maturing moments and the success, the little successful moments. I didn't have hit records, but I had the feeling of the unity of the band and writing together and being a group. And so those moments keep, keep you in the game so to speak. And then in 81, having a hit record called Sweetheart with Frank in the Knockouts kind of justified that, you know, all those years that I put into it, you know, that my dream had come true, that I had a hit record and I was on Billboard and I was top 10. And so that, again, nurtures the feeling of, okay, I'm going to keep doing this. And so you do it out of the love and the passion of doing it because the monetary numbers weren't really there, but they were just survival dollars to keep you in the game. I remember somebody saying on this show one time, they said that the only thing harder for them to handle than failure was success. And I'm curious, what do you think about that? Well, you know, as you have success when you're younger, I understand that that statement from you because you haven't matured as a person person that is like 18, 19 years old that has success and all this money and, you know, these accolades, I think what happens, they become entitled and they think that, you know, well, this was easy. And, you know, they, they become a little cocky about it. As you mature as a, as a writer and, and you've getting knocked down a few pegs, you know, it lets you know, are you in this for real? Or are you just in it to see if, you know, you can make a few dollars? So, Getting, getting, you know, knocked down is part of the process of telling yourself, are you in it for real or, or are you just playing around? So for me, I was knocked down lots of times, selling cars out of my driveway to make enough money to take a voice lesson, keep on writing songs so I didn't have to join a cover band and learn a bunch of cover songs because I believed that I needed to write a song and sing a song to justify why I was doing all of this. Well, on the note of writing songs, 
There is an anthem that you wrote, and I also want to turn the attention of the listeners to this website, OneWorldOurSong.com. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about what inspired it, uh, not only originally, but also what you've decided to do with it now. Yeah, interesting. After um, winning the Academy Award back in 1988, for I've had the time of my life, obviously Dirty Dancing, I was chosen as a, one of 25 songwriters to represent the United States and go to the first ever songwriting summit in Moscow during the Glasnost period, where Russia was starting to loosen up some of its grip on, on its people and allow a little more freedom back into the Soviet Union. And so I went there with Barry Mann and Mike Stoller and, and Diane Warren and Desmond Child. 25 of us went there. And we were able to write in nine days, 50 songs. And so from those 50 songs, I was able to write with a blind Estonian named Sergei Manukian and his writing partner, Mick Targa, and a young lady, an American songwriter named Pamela Philip Olin, who wrote many, many, many songs for Frank Sinatra. And let's see, uh, not Gladys Knight, but she wrote songs for him. I'm blanking on uh, Patti LaBelle is another song, right? I mean, the singer that she wrote songs for, Aretha Franklin, many, many songs. And so the four of us wrote a song. And now you have to understand that here we are as Americans and we're writing with Russians that can't speak English and we can't speak Russian. So we're doing this with interpreters. And through interpreters, we were able to write a song called One World. And the common denominator there was music. Music speaks louder than words. And so, you know, 50 songs were written and we came back home and Columbia Records picked 10 songs to do an album called Music Speaks Louder Than Words. And so One World was chosen and Earth, Wind and Fire recorded it. Now that's the good news. The bad news of this whole story was that there was Columbia Records going through a regime change and the album, Music Speaks Louder Than Words, kind of went on the shelf and never really materialized. Skip forward 30 years and we're in this pandemic and I'm seeing my friends, uh, musicians and actors going through hard times, not being able to pay their bills, no music. No concerts, no no going out for anyone, quarantining, and them saying, how am I going to pay my bills? So I started thinking, doing an interview, being asked about, you know, how, how are you going to make it to the other side? How, how are Americans? So I said, it's not about America. It's about the world. We're living in one world. Everybody is connected now with this. We have to come together. And it, it kind of like turn a light bulb on and reminded me of the song One World. So I called Pamela and I said, let's re-record One World and let's put it out and let's raise money for these songwriters, for these musicians, for these actors. And I said, and there's another charity, the First Responders Children Foundation. And it's all the first responders that are out there on the, on the front lines that are helping that can't make it, that pass away, and their children are left with no parents and, and nowhere to live or go to college. So this charity helps those those children. And so we've put this all together, and uh, uh, she said, I have a guy named John Gillitan, who is a, a really great songwriter, producer, piano player. He wrote New Attitude for, for Patti LaBelle. He, he would be a perfect person to record this for us. So in doing so, he started recording the track. We started going back and forth. We're grabbing players. And he had just a ton of these star players that, that he had worked with through the years that sang with uh, Herbie Hancock, the lead singer uh, that, that was uh, Michael Mayo, and then the lead singer for Tower of Power, the original lead singer, Ellis Hall. And uh, Darnell Hall, who uh, was uh, toured with Michael Jackson, and this great, great singer, Judith uh, Hill, 
who um, was in 20 Feet from Stardom, which was a, a movie that she starred in and has an album out. So all of these singers and players from Toto and all these other groups started playing. And we created this new version of One World, which came out and uh, went to number 30 on the charts. So here we are able to, you know, start to raise awareness of, of the song and raise money and, and the money that comes in from the, you know, radio airplay and um, the downloads. Now you can go to oneworldoursong.com. You'll see those charities. You pick a charity. If you, if you can afford a dollar, you know, donate a dollar and you get a free download of One World. Uh, right now it's on Pandora, it's on Spotify, it's on uh, Amazon, it's on all these different uh, digital sites. So it, it's a, a song that we feel is, is an anthem type song to give back. All of us writers are trying to help our fellow musicians and actors and children. That was a mouthful, but that's what that's what's happening with this song. Again, I want to mention the website. It's oneworldoursong.com, and they can contribute. They can get the song there. And something that I liked about the website, I'm somebody, I'm a real songwriter nut. I, I, I love talking to songwriters, and I like that the songwriters are featured there, including you, I'm curious, who are your songwriting influences? Well, that's a good question. You know, back in the day, for me, it was always the first group that I gravitated to were the Young Rascals. That kind of blue-eyed soul kind of voice. So, you know, that had this pop element, but songs that were catchy enough that would become, now people think when you say pop songs, that that's a curse word. Pop means popular. So I enjoy writing popular songs. So obviously, you know, the Rascals, you know, the greatest songwriters of all time, the Beatles, you know, you gravitate toward the, the, the top echelon of songwriting. And to me, that's the Beatles. And there are so many other great, great songwriters. Simon and Garfunkel. You know, Billy Joel's an unbelievable songwriter. There, there are so many. You know, there, there's so many. Stevie Wonder is an incredible songwriter. So all of those people are part of the influence of me growing up and, and listening to their music and, and being a part of, you know, you, you borrow from so many people as, as you songwrite. You know, there's only a certain amount of notes and chords you can, can have and put them in certain orders and, and stay your way. So, you know, all of those different groups and, and, and people have influenced me. On the note of your song, I've had the time of my life. That's one of those songs. I mean, it was a few days ago, I was at the gas station pumping gas and it came, it was on the, the speakers over the, the covered part of the gas station <laughs> And it's just one of those enduring songs. Are you ever surprised by the success of that song or its longevity? Yes. Yes, I am. And, you know, it's, it's turned into like a phenomenon for, uh, you know, that a, a little, you know, a song that I would write would have such an impact on the world. And, and you know, it continues on from generation to generation and the song gets passed on. You know, I have this theory that if the song Yesterday by the Beatles came out today, it would be a hit record because it's a really good song. And so a really good song seems to live on. And, you know, it lives on because people, me, you, millions of people have agreed that it lives on. And the more agreement, the more success we have. Something I think is really cool, and again, I'm going to point the listeners in the direction of facebook.com slash dirty dancing demos. I always think it's <laughs> so interesting to hear demos. There have been some demos I've heard where I thought, I swear this is better than <laughs> the version you hear on the radio, but I'm hoping you can tell us about this, this chance that the listeners have that they can hear 
the version before, for example, Eric Carmen recorded Hungry Eyes. Right. You know, when I got standard to write for Dirty Dancing, I was one of 150 songs that were submitted. I was the 150th song submitted. On the day that they were filming the movie, out of sequence, the last scene first. So what happens is the song, they're getting ready to do the last scene, but do a Lionel Richie track. And um, Emil Ardolino comes in, the director goes, one more, one more song. Wait a minute, let's listen to this song. And they put Time of My Life on. And they all looked at each other and went, we're making the movie to that song. Now, that was me singing with Rochelle Capelli. So they filmed that day to my demo. And the next day they filmed to my demo of Hungry Eyes, which I had sent in as well. So, you know, um, when I met Patrick at the Academy Awards, he was like all over me with who's who's singing on the demo and, you know, wanting to know all these specifics about the demo. And I said, well, why, why is this so important? And he said, because we didn't really like the movie at all because we didn't have an original song to end the movie. And then Time of My Life happened to us. And the demo was so inspirational that we had such a tremendous ending to our movie that the camaraderie for the actors kind of did a 180. And and we went, let's go make a movie. So what happens is that people get what I call demo-itis. They start to, you know, fall in love with the demo And then when the record comes out, they're like, well, geez, you know, I I really love that demo. So what I did with those demos when Patrick Swayze passed away was I took those demos, Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes. And there's a third song that's on that Dirty Dancing demo. It's called Someone Like You that's in the stage play. And I sell them, not for me. I sell them and I donate the money to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network in Patrick's memory. The Dirty Dancing Demos is another part of the charities that I try to, like One World is a Charity for Musicians and Actors and Children. This Dirty Dancing Demos on Facebook is for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, and I've raised about close to $30,000 for them selling a little bit of history, a little bit of what time of my life, what they danced to, what Baby and Johnny actually danced to in, in Dirty Dancing. How cool. Well done. Thank you. My pleasure. Facebook.com slash Dirty Dancing Demos on Facebook. They can also just type in Dirty Dancing Demos and they'll get it. So Patrick Swayze, he must have made quite an impression on you. What was he like? You know, he was basically Johnny Castle, you know, the the same character, the the big-hearted tough guy, you know, that Oh, I had a chance to do some charity events with him and, and get to meet him. And I walked in to the hospital where this charity was going on. And uh, I, I was holding two records. And both of those records, one was the first Dirty Dancing album that was painted with the picture of Patrick and Jennifer standing next to each other. And the second one was called More Dirty Dancing. And it was a red record. And he looked at me and he was like, I never got a any of those, where did you get those? And I said, well, RCA sent them to me. He goes, man, those are cool. I never really got one. And I said, yeah, you did. And he goes, no, I didn't. I go, I handed him the record. I said, yeah, you did. And mm-hmm. so he goes, he looks at me and he goes, you got to sign this for me. So I signed it and I took the other record and I said, now sign this one for me. So I have a picture of Patrick signing mine and me signing his. And it sits on my wall next to the record, next to the original lyrics of Time of My Life. And it's one of my prized possessions. What would you say is the best thing about being Frankie Previtt? That I'm being, you know, I've been blessed. That's the best part. I've had great parents that that taught me my values. They showed me that hard work sometimes, not always, but hard work. Hard work can pay off for you. And that, you know, I just, I've been blessed, you know, to have this success in my life. There are so many better songwriters. There are so many better singers. 
I was in the right place at the right time with the right song. And, you know, if you take one element out of the dirty dancing equation, take Patrick out, take the song out, take the story out, take Jennifer out, take one of those elements out. I don't believe you have the same phenomenon. I don't think you have the dirty dancing as we know it. I always like to end the show. I just give the guest the microphone. I just let them go anywhere, anywhere they want. We've talked about so many things from songwriting to all kinds of things, but what would you say to anyone who's tuned in? I would say that, you know, my passion right now is to take this song one world and, and help heal us. This nation is in a little bit of turmoil. The song is a kind of like a, we are the world type song. It has a healing power. Music has a power. And so if people can embrace listening to this song, go to Pandora, you play the song. It's free. Just go there and play the song and, and tell a friend about the song. Go to the website, donate what you can. We need to heal each other now in America. And here's a, a song that has the power, hopefully, to spark a healing moment for us. But when we come out on the other side, we have musicians that can play again. We have families that can go out to dinner. We, we have a chance to, you know, do the things that we are restricted for doing right now. So that, that's really, thank you for giving me this moment to say that, because it's really important to me. Thank you. My pleasure. Very well stated. Well, Frankie, sir, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate that you've given me this time. All right, sir. Until next time. Well, you know what? Hang in there. Stay safe. And uh, we'll talk again, my friend. All right, sir. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to the Paul Leslie Hour. Hosted, written, and produced by Paul Leslie. Intro theme song, Alexander's Ragtime Band, written by Irving Berlin, performed by Dan Barrett. Outro scatting G-Things, improvised, performed, and produced by John Goodwin. Until next time. Goodbye.